poor fashion model, Madeline Parker. Along with her black powers, went her mind. I'm told she's to be consigned to the women's ward of Grassland State Mental Hospital. The doctors there give her little hope of ever recovering her sanity. That was where the story was supposed to end, but it didn't. The story of a modern day witch trying to rule the fashion world by itself would seem worthy of a Pulitzer, or at least a made for TV movie. But that would sell short what turned out to be an incredible backstory, running back centuries, and I had only found the tip of that iceberg. Madeline had far more ambitions, and as it turned out, names. What I tell you now will go down in my own writings as one of the most supernatural events I have ever witnessed. I consider it to be facing one or more of my greatest threats, along with my greatest success in saving us all from what only I try to write about. I refer to it as the Collinsport Incident. October 26, 1975. Jerry Langley considered it a dream job, working the night shift on D Ward at Grassland, being paid to basically be a babysitter for locked up nutcases was low stress as supervisors rarely cared about anything that happened between when they leave and when they come back, as long as it's cleaned up and didn't require paperwork. One of the recent perks of the job came from the resident in room D6. Her name is Madeline, and she used to be a model before she lost her mind. Normally, she is unresponsive and babbles. But a week ago, her nighttime actions changed. He had noticed that after midnight, she had started dancing around her cell, naked. So his hourly patrol stop had become a free peep show, and, aside from some nasty scarring, she still had a model body. He was enjoying tonight's show, watching her backside as she swayed to non-existent music from the window's pale moonlight. Then she stopped. When she turned around, he saw more than he bargained for. Not just her gorgeous body, but her face as well, fully healed. But her eyes, they saw him, saw into him. Poor Jerry. Before he knew it, he had unlocked the door and let her out. Her embrace was to die for her. And he did. The next day I heard the news and realized that an already homicidal woman may be more dangerous if she had somehow rejoined her contract with the Dark Powers. I went to Grassland under my normal duties of getting a story, but was thinking of my own self-preservation, considering my efforts put her there and she may hold a grudge. The doctors were cooperating with both the press and the authorities providing pictures and some background information so the public could identify her, but keep, kept any medical personal details confidential. But it's amazing what doors can be opened, or in this case, file cabinets, with the introduction of the Brothers Jackson. Forty dollars later, and I had ten minutes uninterrupted access to her admission papers, psych profile, and doctor therapy notes. It seemed a week ago, she became somewhat more focused in her babbling, talking about needing to go home. At that point, they thought they may have a hope of her recovering. They planned to try and contact the only person listed as next of kin, but they were unable to when she was first brought in. The file referred to a Collinswood maim 
as a birthplace, but her records show that she was actually born in Massachusetts. My later research found a Collins Port name did exist, so maybe there was something to her rambling, since her parents, a pair of Gothic romance novelists, had both died in a car wreck some years back. Back at INS, it took all I could to convince Tony a psycho killer on the loose is a better story for me to cover, then regrettably hand over the coverage of the Egyptian President Anwar Sadat's visit to America on forging peace with Israel to Ron. In the end, Tony agreed since Updike's bloodhound skills couldn't lead him to find out who has been stealing his coffee mug. Besides, I wrote the story of her downfall, so it's logical that I should write the escape. But for Vincenzo, the quickest way to trigger his heartburn is through his wallet. The plane ticket cost meant I would be staying in the closet of a Howard Johnson's. But Collinsport, Maine, here I come. On the flight into Bangor, I had some time to read some books on the history of Maine, and one name kept popping up, Collins. A family that came from England in the 18th century to operate a fleet of fishing ships, and later its own cannery, becoming quite wealthy. Apart from the village named for them that supports the business, they had a coastal estate known as Collinwood. This is where I'll try and find Madeline, or anyone who knows her. I took a 50-mile bus ride to Collinsport and got a room at the Collinsport Inn for Saul. Tony's wallet will be pleased that it's out of season rates. After a meal at a local tavern, answers on finding Collinwood was easy. Getting there, not so much. The village was economically challenged due to years of overfishing, so there were no taxis. I had to pay a delivery driver from a grocery store to take me there. And the ride was a bit scary with a very steep, twisting road. The estate was huge with gardens, structures, forests, all gloomy and not maintained. It was a ghost of its former glory. Arriving before sunset, the door was answered by a somewhat squeamish looking man. I introduced myself and explained I was here to talk to a Mr. Barnabas Collins about a woman he may know or be related to. Willie brought me in and said Barnabas was expected to arrive shortly from elsewhere on the estate. He led me into a large parlor, passing through halls that were lit by candles. This place is so old, much of it never got electrical wiring. He introduced me to a lady, Dr. Julia Hoffman, who is Barnabas' physician and close friend. She was warm, but gave me the feeling her style and breeding was beyond my pay grade, although she found my hat quite amusing. She took interest in my story, saying, as far as she knew, Barnabas had no close relative women, here or in England where he came from years ago. As I gave her the details of Madeline's insanity, I learned that she is the chief of staff at a nearby sanitarium. At this point, I don't know if I'm lucky or if this hints that there's more bad things in store for me later. Item. I would later learn the dark history of this family and its curses explains why a shrink would hang around this place. While I fumbled to find a photo of Parker to show her, in case it was a patient she knew, the mood of the room changed. I heard a voice behind me say, I hope Julia has kept you entertained, Mr. Kolchak. I understand you wish to speak to me. My name is Barnabas Collins.
I turned around to find a man who looked out of time, dark and mysterious. Impeccably dressed suit with some kind of cloak and a walking cane with a wolf's head. He was smiling at me, very friendly, but something in me was giving me a sense of danger, something familiar. I stopped to shake hands and thank him for the audience and explained that a dangerous woman had escaped an institution and is missing, who had listed him as close as relative. He said he had none and no one in the Collins family living wherever a model. He apologized that I had come all this way for nothing. So I pulled out the picture and said, are you sure you don't know this woman? When he stared at the picture, he froze like he'd seen a ghost. I later learned how right I was. More importantly, I got those same looks from both Willie and Dr. Hoffman when they saw it. Oh, they definitely knew her and how dangerous she is. I said, I'm guessing you realize how serious this is. So was she an escapee from your facility as well, Dr. Hoffman? No, I... Barnabas, what does this mean? Mr. Kolchak, this Miss Parker you know has gone by other names and she has been threatening my life and my family for many years. Many years. Please, tell me everything you know about her and your encounter. I said that there may be some parts they'll think are crazy to believe, but he assured me they would believe every word. And they did. They accepted that she was a witch with demonic powers as readily as if I said she cheated on her taxes. I could feel the fear pulsing in them reflecting on this woman. What could she have done to them? And how did they stop her before? They asked me to please wait here a moment, then all stepped outside the room to consult. While it was refreshing finding others who actually believed me, the downside is I just joined a larger group of targets for her wrath. When they came back in, Bartimus was wearing his cloak again. He told Willie to go into town and see if Quentin had returned back from Portland to inform him of what's happened and bring him straight to the old house. Mr. Kolchak, thank you for warning me of this great danger to my family. Because you have fought her before, and are also in danger. We will take you into our confidence and tell you more about the witch we know as Angelique. There's a long history behind this Angelique enough to make a soap opera. But I'll detail here what Barnabas told me at that time, which wasn't the whole story or truth, as you'll later find. Angelique was born in the 18th century. As a young girl, she grew up under the influence of a powerful practitioner of the black arts, a warlock named Judah Zachary. When discovered and accused by the Catholic Church, she turned on him and confessed to save herself while he burned at the stake. She became the maid to Countess Josette Dupree and traveled with her to Collinwood, where she met and had an affair with my ancestor that I am named after. Jealous that he and her countess were to marry, she used her magic to make Josette and his brother fall in love and elope. Discovering her witchcraft, Barnabas killed her, only to be cursed by her spirit, to cause pain and heartbreak for his family ever since. She was reincarnated into existence more than once, and as I fear has happened again. 
She mostly focuses her attacks on myself and my cousin, Quentin. I left Julia Collingwood to await his return. She will tell him where we are and what to expect. Barnabas was telling me this. As we walk through the cool evening air to the other side of the estate, they call the old house. It was the mansion before the mansion, and he resides there. This place was old. Candles, fireplaces, maybe a generator for a few appliances. He took me through a side entrance, I later found out why, to access an unused section of the house. As he suspected, it had been used recently, judging by the movement of cobwebs. She had come here looking for something. There was a bracelet Angelique kept with her, something that may add to her magical powers. His ancestor kept it hidden in a secret room in this part of the house. We searched for her first, but then discovered both were now gone. Barnabas was convinced that Angelique was preparing to work some new magic, one that could doom all of us if she completes it. But while we had been searching through musty old rooms in the dark, she had already begun working on that spell elsewhere. Back at Cullenwood, Dr. Hoffman, who felt uneasy waiting for Quentin to arrive, was about to be attacked. We later learned that Angelique used her powers to put Julia under her control. When Willie arrived with Quentin, this Dr. Hoffman said that Angelique had returned with a vengeance. She told Willie that Barnabas wanted him to stay at Cullenwood in case Angelique showed up there. She was to bring Quentin to the mausoleum to meet with Barnabas to destroy Angelique's body. But this was not the plan. It was her trap. Back in the old house, Barnabas went to find some things. A talisman and a music box. He said it might wield some defense or distraction against her. But Angelique already destroyed both. I'd been going through my head deciding which parts of the story I could just forget about telling to Tony. When standing in the drawing room, I saw a portrait. A very old portrait of my host. When Barnabas saw me staring at it, he said, Yes, as you can see, the Collins bloodline has a very strong genealogy. I look just like my ancestor, as well as carry his name. But this was not the first time I ran into this situation. Oh no, that doesn't look like you. That is you. I backed away, clutching my bag of stuff. As I was about to reach in to pull out something, he said, Yes. Mr. Kolchak, that is part of the curse. It forces I and Quentin to be reborn like her, so she can watch us suffer and die again and again, an eternity of losing the ones we love, just to feed her vengeance. With that, I stopped. Imagine going through generation after generation dealing with magical forces causing tragedies to your family and friends. Sympathy overrode instincts, and I believed him, even though that wasn't the whole truth. Okay, so what do we do, and how can we stop her? He said there is only one other place where she could be to gather her powers, at her grave. The body of her last incarnation had been placed inside a secret room in the Collins family mausoleum. He had stored some kerosene and materials there at all times, just in case this would happen. When I asked him why he held off from doing it before, he said because deep down he always hoped she could change. He still held love for some part of her, even after centuries of her evil deeds. So we headed out into the brisk night. Two men against a supernatural force, hoping to break a never-ending curse. He had experience and a silver-headed cane. I had my instincts and a bag full of weapons I used against vampires and a normal witch. What good would that do me?
I am Angelique. I have been born again and again, throughout the centuries, to seek the darkest powers and use them to torment the two men who have spurned my love, Quentin and Barnabas and all the Collins family. I do not remember much about this reincarnation before the sanitarium, it took time for the madness to bring out my true personality. Once awakened I was drawn here, to the Collinwood estate to gather what traces of my magic it held, and to my former body. It also is a vessel of my powers. I am now strong enough to complete a spell to grant me near limitless powers. I will draw my incantations out of both men and sacrifice their souls to forge a new link to the netherworld, their end shall be my new beginning. Being the same person over centuries does have some advantages. Access to old bank accounts, building interest, knowing where hidden or lost treasures are, and remembering old pathways and shortcuts long forgotten. Barnabas was leading me along one of those, a trail used by horse carriage as a way to get to Eagle Hill Cemetery, the resting place of the Collins family, prominent townspeople of the past, and the body of Angelique. He knew the path well and easily made his way, but I was having great difficulty and was slowing him down. He's not even using a flashlight. Can he see in the dark? Quentin and Julia took the more modern roads using a car, making the longer route in shorter time and arrived there first. As they approach the mausoleum, Julia stops and wavers, coming out of Angelique's control and is confused. Quentin, I, I don't understand. Where are we? Before Quentin can respond, Angelique's voice comes booming out of the entryway of the mausoleum. Why, you are right where I want you. Inside my trap. She laughs with wicked glee. Quentin turns to confront her as she steps out of the entryway, but was gripped by a powerful force and his body started to emit a reddish glow Dr. Hoffman collapsed to the ground, helpless to react. Angelique then started to recite her incantation, a jumble of words in rhyme. It affected Quentin in both the glow he emitted and the form he took. The spell transforms him into a werewolf, a curse he has carried for centuries and tried many times to undo or resist. Still held, you could see the red energy surrounding him start to leech away into Angelique, drawing away the power of her curse. Barnabas led me through an old back gate at Eagle Hill Cemetery and the family mausoleum was close enough, we could see a red glow. Sensing the danger, Barnabas said, she's here, and darted ahead of me. He rushed to Quentin and Julia, and became caught by another force. This time, a glow that was golden surrounded him. Oh, Barnabas, ever the white knight charging in to protect your family and friends, only to lose them. As Kolchak approached, he quickly ducked behind a gravestone, seeing that Barnabas had been captured. He could see Madeline, or Angelique, was using some powers to hold them, but the man called Quentin was a werewolf. This changes everything. If I help free them, what's going to save me? As I pondered this, the witch began saying more words, casting her spell, and the winds picked up, carrying the rumbles of thunder. She was summoning the dark forces. Carl noticed a change came over Barnabas, his face in anguish, bearing a set of fangs. He lied 
and wasn't just reborn, but was a vampire, just like Squazzini. That's why I felt uneasy about it. Instinct. Both things were wailing in pain as their life force was drained into Angelique as she glowed, amassing her power. There was just no time to think this through. Either I run away and let her become all-powerful with their demise, or I break up this monster match and probably get torn to shreds for my reward. I took a breath. I reached in my bag, tightened my gut, and said, God, help me. I jumped out from behind the gravestone, started shaking my mojo bag, and proclaimed, Angelique, I hereby proclaim that you are a witch. You practice the dark arts and are in league with Satan. The sounds of my words and the mojo bag made her eyes grow wide and totally disrupted what she was doing. She screamed, No! It must have been a critical point in the linking to the underworld. The glow around her flared into flames. The glow around both Colin's men vanished and they fell to the ground. But all eyes and ears were focused on the screams, the form of Angelique as she was devoured by those unholy flames, taking her and themselves back to whatever pit in hell that awaits her in eternal torment. Once the grisly vision was gone, I quickly turned my attention to the next threat, or two, or three. What kind of monster might Julia be? As the two men rose, I drew the crucifix from my bag and held it in front of me. While it wasn't made of silver, maybe a werewolf wouldn't know that. I waved it in front of Barnabas, yelling, Stay back! I know what you are! The Elder Collins raised his hand and looked fearful, and then stopped. Quentin came to his feet, looking human again. He saw me fending off and said, Barnabas, no! But Barnabas had a calm look on his face and composed himself, looking relieved. It's over, Quentin. I'm finally free. With a smile, he slowly walked over to me, placed his hand on the cross, and said, You won't need this, Mr. Kolchak. I am now just a mortal man. The curse of Angelique is no more. Dumbfounded, I looked over at Quentin and said, Oh yeah? What about him? Over the next few minutes, while seeing to Dr. Hoffman, they explained that the curse Quentin is under was held in check with a painting he kept that stops his lunar transformations. They filled me in on the more ominous details of the family history they withheld earlier on the ride back to Collinwood. Once there, Quentin found that that painting had disintegrated. The curse holding him also was gone. A parting gift from the demise of Angelique. The next day, the sun did shine in Collinwood in a way that was not seen in a very long time. Barnabas had our breakfast out on the front terrace enjoying the sunrise like a newborn child. He said his family would forever be in my debt and that there would always be a room for me here at Collinwood. A nice benefit, since there is absolutely nothing in this story I could give to my editor, Vincenzo. If I even mention some of it, 
he'd cancel my ticket home and leave me here. I would end up telling him that it was a dead end and just write a follow-up story that homicidal Madeline Parker was still at large, but we know never to be found. But the real story would come sometime later. A nice human interest article. How an old, illustrious family's business had turned around and began prospering again. Due to a change in the ocean tides, the fishing business was back again, raising the fortunes of both the Collins family and the town they founded. Business in Collinsport was thriving and a haven for artists of all venues, making it a tourist attraction. I take my vacations there, enjoying that room and doing some fishing of my own. Barnabas and Julia have become a happy couple with him wanting to settle down to a normal, manner-born life. He had Collinwood and the old house renovated, sealing off all the secret rooms and hidden passageways to remove the bad memories. Willie had stepped up, going into management at the cannery, and doing quite well. The rest of the family is there, except for Quentin. No longer under the shadow of the wolf or Angelique, he travels the world with his nephew, cousin, blood relative, Chris, whose curse was also lifted as it came from Quentin. The breaking of the Collins family curse has truly brought peace and prosperity to all involved, even me. As my time reporting the news drew to a career end, I found that Barnabas was a generous patron whose occasional stipend helped me through the leaner times to come. This was the one time my good deed went unpunished.